right, um, so hi, my name is Paolo and I'm blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, uh, I, I, so I mostly make games, uh, that I mostly made games that can be played uh, and uh, downloaded for free as small industria and uh, spread to the internet uh, and, uh, and so on. Wait, 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 wait. Um, and uh, you know, like before uh, YouTube and Lolcats, uh, uh, flash games were like that, kind of like the first viral media. And uh, I was kind of thrilled by the idea that a little subversive game could reach, uh, you know, millions of people uh, and, uh, you know, supposedly have some kind of impact. I, I had no idea what it was. But uh, just, just to show you, like a game I'm working on right now is a kind of a pu puppy mill simulation uh, sandbox in which you are trying to breed the ideal, perfect, pure dog. And uh, you know, its subtext is the historical relationship between uh, eugenics and sele selective breeding uh, for dogs, and so it's like about racial purity and uh, uh, and, th and things like that. So this is just to say that um, even if it might contradict some of the points that I'm about to make, I still uh, uh, like uh, uh, to make uh, this like kind of package, self-contained games because because I'm I'm an artist essentially. Uh, but more and more. Um, I've been thinking about what's around these games uh, and how and where uh, they are produced, uh, distributed, and uh, played. Uh, because I think games for change or transformational games or games for impact uh, are often hyped as these magical objects with inner powers. Uh, um, the power you know, to teach something, the power to change behaviors or to encourage action, to foster empathy, and so on. And, um, these are games that are, you know, supposedly reproducible and can reach a massive audience, a massive user base, and justify the investment that went into making them. And it seems to me that the ultimate dream is to create software that automatically performs the work of social change for us. Uh, you put a game in a classroom and it does the teaching, and partially replacing textbooks, textbooks and uh, teachers. Uh, uh, you put a game in a phone uh, and it changes the user behavior. You put a game in uh, my face and you force me to empathize and things like that. And uh, to me, it's like a kind of a broadcast model that focuses on what's on, uh, on these boxes that we call games uh, and uh, um, how to package this world the changing content into games and apps uh, or whatever sexy new technology or genre comes about uh, in order to be activated later by users. Uh, and uh, you know, users, regardless of where they are and who they are, and how these boxes even work. So um, I'm going to talk about a couple of projects, uh, recent projects, and propose uh, a few very different ways to think about games for change in uh, a context, uh, in an attempt to sort of challenge the fetishization of uh, these artifacts, um, whatever that illustration means. I don't have no idea. Um, so, uh, first, uh, first point, first, uh, game platforms. Games don't exist in a vacuum. For example, they exist within uh, technological platforms, uh, which have their own embedded values and their own embedded politics. Uh, for example, like Phone Story was this game I made like a bunch of years ago. Uh, it's just basically like for, uh, I wonder if, uh, if, the, if there's a way to play, to play the uh, videos, uh, obviously. This thing was working perfectly. Oh, okay. I just have to click. Hello, um, it's a game for more fo uh, phones that I made a bunch of years Let ago. You, you can uh, kill the uh, sound, really. It's just four simple mini games with a voiceover coming from the phone, or supposedly from the phone itself, uh, that describe the, pro the production process of the device from uh, you know, the coltan mines in Congo to the assembly lines in China. And uh, really, as a game in itself, it's the worst game I've ever made. It's just terrible. <laughs> But it was more of an intervention. It was like an, an intervention in a specific technological platform, which was the smartphone and the app, and the app as a as a form, as a genre, I guess. Um, and uh, um, the idea was also to turn the app monetization process into a way to raise funds for the organizations that are involved into changing these conditions. Uh, and the plan didn't work out very well because we were banned from the main market, the app store, and the ban also revealed this new whole um, uh, layer of platform politics. The fact that, yeah, this is like essentially an educational game, but you will not find it on the app store. Um, so my most re uh, re recent release is a VR thing, it's called A Short History of the Gays, and uh, it's an experiential essay about the relationship between uh, gays and violence. Uh, it's an essay in the sense of like, a think about a film essay, but ex instead of exploring uh, a theme 
through uh, language and images. It, it tries to do so through a series of scenarios and micro interaction, basically looking and not looking at things, uh, uh, like from uh, you know the evolution of sight in a Precambrian sea creature to um, uh, a pan an infinite panopticon and so on. So it's in a more abstract and academic way. This piece is also about um, essentially responding to. Uh, Technocultural context, which is the discourse around VR, VR as presence, uh, as uh, an embodiment, VR as empathy amplifier, supposedly through emotional overwhelming, and uh, VR as uh, liberation from a directorial gaze, and so on. And it's reflecting on the affordances of the platform. The act of, the act of looking is so central to uh, virtual reality, and it's rarely problematized because the headset as an interface is so mimetic that kind of disappears. So. Uh, Instead of game uh, as self-contained, and this is another sec second chapter, instead of games as self-contained uh, media objects to you know, be packaged and distributed, we can see them as processes and protocols. And Ben and Mohini just uh, talked about uh, player-centric design, so I'm gonna repeat some of this stuff in a less charming way. Uh, I think we can open up the process of game creation and make uh, uh, the act of game creation a transformative and relational practice. Uh, uh, people do that in education, like the Institute of Play comes to my mind, uh, but a bit less frequent, frequently in advocacy and activism. This is a relatively old, relatively old example, but it's still one of my favorites. It's called uh, Love Punks. Uh, and it's an Australian cultural initiative toward the preservation of Aboriginal uh, er heritage. And the game is re the result of essentially a workshop to empower Aboriginal kids in this poor region. Uh, and they created their own uh, kind of like subculture slash gang uh, with music, comics, uh, and uh, films that are all part of, the, of this essentially transmedia narrative. And uh, this game that incorporates the participants themselves, uh, and uh, it also happens to be a very real, uh, a really weird and cool looking game. So this, this is a great example. And another one uh, is uh, TV Tales by uh, Hannah Nicklin. Uh, which is a storytelling a twine game, a storytelling ba uh, game based on her uh, six month long residency in a social housing program in uh, East London. So she collected stories of residents, mostly immigrants and refugees, uh, and uh, ran uh, poetry, game design, and storytelling workshops as a kind of ex exchange. And uh, I think participatory design is pretty much the only proper way to work with marginalized gr groups because uh, you know you don't want to speak for the subject, uh, you don't want to speak about the subject and, and turn it into a passive object, or uh, even worse, extract financial and cultural value from uh, their suffering uh, or lived experience. So you want to give the subjects the tool to express themselves or at least have a two-way exchange, and that was the idea of this kind of like game project that is also a relational uh, contextual practice type of uh, work. Um, earlier this year, uh, I was in, uh, at the first uh, city gaming conference in uh, Rotterdam, and I was quite impressed to see how many architects and organizers and policy makers uh, are experimenting with games as a way to facilitate participatory urban, urban planning. Um, especially in Europe, but there are some good examples in, uh, in the U.S. as well. Um, These projects, even, uh, like, even if they are not always co-designed, uh, they always result in a kind of dynamic social pro process, in a kind of like a back and forth relationship, or essentially the game uh, uh, structure of conversations between citizens uh, and between different stakeholders that is also on a meta level. Like how is this game actually re really representing our problem, yes or no? And uh, if you're there in person, you can also undermine it. And uh, if the game is analog, a tabletop, you can uh, kind of like take it apart pretty easily. Um, and I think it's important to note that these games slash workshops might not really always produce uh, very slick end products, uh, like cool trailers that you can uh, show off at conferences and uh, use in marketing. Uh, the games might not even make sense uh, out of this very specific context, uh, and I think that's fine. Um, obviously, this, time, uh, th this type of initiative requires the um, kind of an organic uh, grassroots approach. Uh, uh, if we want to see games that address a multitude of issues uh, in a multitude of community through a multitude of strategies, uh, uh, we cannot just rely on a small industry 
made of professionals who can fly to conferences like this one and acquire the language and the connection to obtain big grants and investments and so they can make big slick games uh, and then hire consultants to demonstrate that these uh, games actually work uh, so they can get more grants or private investments and so on. Uh, no, I think this is all fine, but as game development is increasingly more accessible and dem democratized, we can uh, actually work, be more proactive in creating an ecology of informal game development. And that means thinking about the material conditions that allow a multitude of actors uh, to produce the games we want to see. Uh, so we can flip the slogan and uh, thinking about like what is the change for games, right? And uh, actually probably better like draw a reciprocal relationship between uh, uh, you know games uh, and uh, and change uh, so like what kind of political change do we need uh, in order to stimulate the emergence of more transformational and socially engaged games um, and I can think about various things like maybe some kind of for, uh, some form of universal basic income uh, or universal health care or basically the safety net that will allow more people to go independent and spend time on projects that might not make any money it might only mean, mean something in the, within their own communities anyway i wrote this piece called uh, uh, titled gaming under socialism uh, feel free to Google it. It's pretty sure it's the first result <laughs> that comes up. Uh, and it's an essay in which uh, I try to imagine how game development will work in a more equitable and uh, uh, democratic society. Uh, so I talk about these things, or sort of like flipping the change uh, uh, game relationship. So I'm going to talk about um, casual games for pro protesters, which are games could design, uh, designed to be played in a specific and transient context. Uh, demonstrations, marches, occupation, rallies. Uh, like how many people, uh, he, like how many people here, for example, went to a demonstration in the last three months? Uh, not bad, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in the right conference, yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, but um, I like I understand better. Like sometimes, like the, the demonstrations don't seem to work, uh, or you have better things to do. But and, and protests can off. Protests can often be alienating uh, and scary or difficult to access uh, for some people, especially if you're not among uh, organ the organizers or if, you're not, if you don't consider yourself an activist. Uh, and, um, and the form formula of rallies and marches can be you know, overwhelming and kind of like trite and so on or unnecessary grave. So um, especially now that there is a thing to oppose every day, we, we were looking for um, a way to kind of like... Um, maybe fight the uh, fat pro protest fat fatigue and make these experiences, uh, experiences more stimulating. Um, so uh, Casual Game for pro pro Protesters is a collaboration I did with this uh, uh, poet and activist and performer called Harry Josephine Gilles, who previously created short poetic games for people who walk outdoors in uh, small England towns. Uh, uh, this is an example for, from uh, the City Walker collection in which you are sort of like... Uh, uh, it's 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 uh, a way to kind of like live uh, sociality in this small town uh, in a different way, um, and uh, so think about some somewhere between uh, Yoko Ono's um, grapefruits, the scores uh, that she's mostly famous for, uh, that are kind of like impossible instructions to execute in your mind as a kind of like a game that you play in your mind, and uh, also the situationist practice of psychogeography that kind of generated this whole like genre of um, how to get lost type of games, uh, uh, like taking pedestrians out, uh, out of their predictable paths and forcing them into a new awareness of the new urban landscape and so on. I wanted to inject more, something more like tactical from the tradition of creative protests like the clown army and so on. So just for example, uh, some, uh, some of these games, uh, they are all like um, zero technology games that you can just like uh, start playing in, at any point point uh, without any preparation. Uh, this one is called Medic and it's basically gamified the still like uncommon practice of bringing useful supplies to a protest. You know, you, go, you show up to a, to a protest and uh, uh, you realize you don't, have, you don't have water or uh, you're hungry and uh, you have a headache. And so like the idea is to, to kind of like uh, generalize and, and to some extent gamify this practice of like showing up with like a bunch of supplies and competing for 
how many people you kind of, you're, you're able to help at, uh, during a demonstration. So it's kind of like almost role playing, uh, live action role playing as a healer during a demonstration. Um, some of them are more propositions or provocations like, uh, like Yoko Ono's scores, like this one. Uh, um, I don't know if ever, anybody will ever try it, but yeah, try, sure. Uh, it's, it's more something to maybe think about. Uh, and others uh, are um, using elements of the landscape uh, that you usually find at a protest, uh, for example, like involving cops uh, as uh, unaware players. So you have a row of cops, uh, kind of like a group of cops, and you're trying to act out or improvise an internal monologue of uh, one of them. And uh, the friends next to you are uh, supposed to um, guess which one you are impersonating, things like that. Um, others, uh, other games are intended to make you maybe look at the urban space more critically, uh, and so it involve the infrastructure of surveillance and, uh, uh, or you know, manifestation of powers. This is a, this is a good game that we, we, I always play with, with my partner, uh, that she could design it. It's called Woman or Concept, basically every time you are, and this is great in Europe, m more, more than uh, in, in the United States, but uh, if you start playing it, you're gonna play it for the rest of your life. Uh, uh, that's, that's part of the rules. Uh, but basically, whenever you, you're seeing a feminine figure, you have to freeze and you ask, is that a woman or a concept? So is that a historical, actually existing woman, or is something like freedom, or um, Italy, or something? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this one was, uh, like, so part of these collections are games that are actually coming from different sources. Uh, uh, so this, is, this was, was created by an English company called Hide and Seek, that some of you might know, uh, who made this series of tiny games. And Snap, Snap Zap uses the surveillance cameras that are already in the environment, and you are pointing at them. And if you are the hacker, you can disable them by pointing at them. If you are the uh, warden, you can point at them and uh, say, like, snap, uh, and uh, you uh, capture the, the hacker or get a point. Uh, some other are coming from um, um, from uh, the tradition of in experimental invisible theater. This is a variation of an Augusto Boal uh, uh, games for actors, sort of like icebreaker game. It's kind of like a um, hand, sh um, how do you call it, like a, it's kind of like a competitive handshaking uh, game in which you're trying to shake the hands of everybody, every other player, but without letting one hand go, so you're kind of like nodding your, your, yourself with another person, and if it becomes, when it becomes competitive, it becomes kind of like weirdly violent, and, uh, and it's kind of interesting. <laughs> Uh, this one is super simple and could be even played here with a minor localization tweak, but I see that I'm kind of running out of time, so I'll just try it later. Uh, you're kind of like staring at each other and trying to open uh, your eyes at the same time and coming up with a solution to a world problem. This, this was uh, play tested and iterated while we were stuck for hours in the uh, subway during the uh, National Women's uh, Day March in Washington. Uh, so like a lot of like demonstration is actually kind of waiting for something to happen that doesn't happen. Um, this is a variation of uh, Burning the Covens, uh, um, Rock, Paper, Scissors. Uh, he made like a series of more like performative group-based ones. Uh, so this is a variation with his blessing actually. Um, and it's basically um, uh, includes a little bit more strategy and politics and meta games and dynamic teams. So, so if you're like the Peace, War, and Revolution are these three uh, sort of like uh, RPS sort of situation, and um, uh, this is a very like uh, um, dialectical relationship between these three things that is a super simplified thing. But anyway, uh, uh, this one probably is, is my favorite, and uh, because it's super broken, it's. It's essentially like a hot and cold game, but it's by consensus. There's, there's not one point that you have to find, but uh, a kind of like a um, point in between all the other points, and it's meant to teach or maybe do perform a kind of commentary on the uh, sign, uh, um, the sign convention, the sign language that was uh, used and perfected uh, during Occupy Wall Street when you're trying to reach a consensus, a decision by consensus. So you're uh, telling a pointer to find a place, and this pointer has to find a spot that satisfies uh, all the possible people in the uh, in, in the room, which becomes a kind of like it kind of breaks down in a in an interesting way. Um, and this was, in, it's almost like a drinking game. It's about kind of like pulling, uh, uh, six people pulling from the same uh, dollar bill and uh, until uh, somebody is left with the biggest um, 
piece. <laughs> uh, anyway, oh, th this one is also a very good one. Uh, uh, like you're, you have to ask, pe you ask people to form a line uh, to order themselves without communicating from uh, the lowest to the h highest income. And uh, it's something that just like, uh, like some people are cannot really handle with it. Uh, like, anyway, uh, so obviously all, not, all the pro all, not all the demonstrations are playful. Most of these games will not be appropriate, for example, to a uh, Black Lives Matter demonstration after uh, murder by the police. Uh, uh, but um, it's probably interesting to point out that uh, Black Lives Matter uh, vigils, as well as, uh, for example, the, the Dakota Pipeline occupation, uh, included some elements of rituality. There were, were like still like kind of rules, and rituals have op overlaps uh, with games uh, in the sense of, in terms of rule set, role play, and uh, forming separate, a separate space. So, so there is something there too that I quite have to figure out. So this is a very simple, uh, casual game for protesters is a very simple and barely deployed project, but in my mind it, in, it incorporates two propositions. Uh, one is very ambitious and one is very modest. And the ambitious one is activist events can and should be designed, designed to be you know, meaningful experiences, and I think participating in social change should be exhilarating and socially and intellectually and physically stimulating. And uh, I think game designers uh, can have a role in it, uh, as well as this new kind of still foggy field of experience design. I'm talking about people who are designing live games, uh, escape their own games, uh, interactive theater, experimental parties, and uh, live action role playing games. If you're interested in that, I think a, a very good philosophical primer on this is uh, Patterns of Transformation by Ida ben uh, Benedetto. Uh, in which she takes clues from the design of funerals, sex parties, and survivalist expeditions to answer the question, uh, what makes an experience life-changing? And uh, can transformational gatherings be designed? So check it out, it's very interesting. So the more modest but general proposition of casual game pro for protesters is this, uh, like l thinking about games for change, uh, not as producers of social change in themselves, but as cultural practices that are embedded in a process of change that is already happening. So a less instrumental way and a more like, maybe like a, a assistive way. It's not the game that produces change. The, the game is just uh, embedded within a, a process that is already happening. Uh, my final point is about making context. Uh, so thinking about context also means uh, creating new context for uh, the production and consumption of games. Uh, uh, I think this conference and this industry loves to ride on the popularity of video games in general. Uh, you know, like five million years collectively spent playing uh, World of Warcraft, that kind of stuff, or like 70 million people watching esports. But to me the problem is that this, this very devoted gaming communities might actually be the most resistant to the idea of games for change because they care so much about their AAA normie games. Uh, and uh, I think so much the, of their identity is defined by the consumption of commercial, actually existing standard games that might even see different kind of games as uh, almost like an existential threat. And uh, we saw that with Gamergate and with the frequent backlashes against uh, artistic, personal, and experimental games. Uh, so I think a crucial goal, a meta goal of this field is uh, expanding the audiences, uh, expanding the context where these games are created and played. And uh, just a, a, a digression, speaking of esports, uh, you probably heard about uh, Buckminster Fuller's so The World Game. It's probably one of the first uh, conceptualization of serious games, uh, and it's still, I think, the most ambitious, the most bonkers, really, uh, which is like this. Make the world, like this is the world game. Make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible times through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. That is the game. Uh, and uh, he was actually kind of serious about it. It was like, um, I, uh, there, are, there are iterations of this game, so some kind of formalization of these games, but basically it was a kind of global resource management uh, game uh, meant to collect information from all over the world, like real world data, big data kind of game. 
uh, and uh, let people and computer simulations find the most efficient allocation of resources. And uh, consider this is the 60s, the computers are barely there, the internet is not really theirs, but she was already Im imagining this possibility. And uh, to me, the most surprising part of this, uh, of this project is that being an architect and a kind of holistic, game, uh, holistic designer, uh, Bucky Fuller immediately thought about the context for this visionary endeavor. Imagine this like global strategic gaming complex. He made sketches like where is this uh, absurd game uh, going to be played? And even imagine this world uh, game as something much like a contemporary esports in which teams from all over the world will compete on live television because it was like this, the stakes are so high in this game that people will be automatically interested in seeing a bunch of nerds kind of competing in allocating resource, resources. And he um, was also thinking about like the best solution from the game will become part of the meta game essentially and it will be turned into actual uh, policies. So, uh, back to the last point, I haven't quite figured this, this out yet, to be honest, uh, uh, about making context. I only have this terrible picture of my next project. It's me pretending to work uh, on a garage that I'm turning into a playful art gallery slash arcade. Think baby castles, something like that. But it will, also, it will also be a gathering space for the local DSA chapter. DSA is the Democratic Socialist of America. Uh, so. Uh, much more modest goal than the world game, but the idea of bringing weird games to a non-gaming non audience uh, and uh, also creating a space when even weirder games can uh, possibly exist, but also creating a nexus for in local indie developers uh, and smoosh together politics and play in the same room and see what happens. So stay tuned, hopefully I'll have better pictures next time. Thank you.